Hey everyone, this is Mike Cranky, Program Director of the uh, Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative at the Cloquet Forestry Center. So welcome. Uh, today we have Carrie Pike, Interim Director of Operations for the Cloquet Forestry Center. Uh, we'll be speaking on seed source control for forestry applications in Minnesota. And uh, before we begin uh, with Carrie's presentation, we have seven of you on the line today. Uh, DNR, ECS people, uh, Forest Service, uh, silviculturalists. Uh, we have uh, two nursery uh, people online. So welcome. I, I know this is going to be a very, very interesting uh, presentation today. So as far as the logistics of the webinar, if you have any questions, uh, do so by typing into the chat pod, which is right below Carrie's photograph in the, the line box you can type in and then press that little brain on the right and your question will come up and Carrie will answer your questions when, when she has an opportunity to do so. The program will last about an hour. Uh, Carrie's presentation will be about 45 minutes. Uh, so you're welcome to uh, type in questions at any time or comments uh, along the way. <clears throat> if you'd like uh, continuing force education credits for uh, this webinar would be one credit. Just type that in by your name and we'll make sure that you get credit for the webinar. So uh, this is one of, of a series of 10 webinars that's co-sponsored with the DNR Department of Forestry, Division of Forestry. So we appreciate uh, Patty Thielen's efforts to also co-sponsor the, uh, the webinar series and supply uh, potential topics uh, for the webinar series. So Carrie Pike is the Interim Director of the Operations and Research Fellow with the Department of Forest Resources uh, with the University of Minnesota. She'll discuss concepts pertaining to seed transfer and seed zones in Minnesota that have implications for tree planting efforts in Minnesota. In addition, the pros and cons of assisted migration in lieu of climate change will be discussed and related to current seed zones and seed transfer guidelines. So with that introduction, I want to welcome Gary Pike. Thank you, Mike. I also need to mention for my research fellow position, I am coordinator of the Minnesota Tree Improvement Cooperative, and that's where a lot of this work overlaps with the Tree Improvement Cooperative. So, um, and I'm also a PhD candidate in the Department of Forest Resources as well. So I'm wearing several hats right now. So. I'm going to proceed to through my slides. Um, first, I'd like to define some terms, because I'm going to be throwing them around as if you know what they mean. First, I'm going to talk about seed source. What is a seed source? And seed source, for me, is seed collected from a single tree or bulked from a group of trees within a defined geographic area. Um, typically, it's considered, you know, somebody goes out and collects seed, usually you collect them from a bunch of trees and you bulk them together and then you ship them back to whoever's going to clean the seed for you. In addition, I'm going to talk about seed source control. Seed source control is the ability to track a tree's geographic origin from seed to the seedling to the planting site. This is harder to do than it seems, mainly because in many cases, uh, small seed lots, small groups, you know, small uh, landowners or just individuals will go out and collect seed. And a lot of people will do it. And then they'll ship them to, to nurseries or to the DNR. And then things get bulked together somehow. And so keeping track of where everything came from and what's kind of the smallest unit that you need to keep track of is very difficult. I'm also going to talk about transfer distance or seed transfer. And that's the distance that seed or seedlings can be moved from the birth location or that they're being moved from the birth location from where the seed is formed to the planting site. When you're talking about seed source control, we have to have metrics for success and for failure. And of course, a lot of things can cause success and failure. So I think the fundamental question is what traits are desirable in your planted tree? And I really, this should say, in a stand of planted trees, because usually in forestry, we're not planting one tree. We're planting many at a time. Um, and I think the biggest expectation is always high survival. You're not going to put the effort into sticking something in the ground if you're afraid it's going to fail. And so we desire always high survival, number one. 
secondly, and this is a little bit more challenging, we want to um, look for growth rates that meet our expectations. And that can be tricky. Foresters are pretty good at this because they get out there in the woods and they look, a lot of, look at a lot of stands. For a private landowner, it's sometimes tough to know if you put those trees in the ground and they're green, are they growing to your expectations? And, and so that can be a difficult one to, to gauge sometimes. Um, you also want trees that break bud and set their buds in tune with the local climate. A red flag is, you know, in the early spring, the trees you planted are fully leafed out and nothing else is. And you can imagine in this neck of the woods that that could be a damaging prospect given early frost. And in addition, on the later end of the season as well, if, if everything has senesced and your, your trees are still out there growing. Also, we, in many cases, we want trees that produce viable seed. Um, you know, we don't want the stand that we're planting to be an evolutionary dead end. We want viable seed. And, you know, in the horticulture industry, you might be looking for flowers. So getting those, those what you're ever, whatever you're planning to reproduction is a metric of success. Other traits will largely depend on the end use. If you're growing, if you bought trees and you're planning for Christmas trees, you'll have an expectation of branch angle and size. It might be different if it was being used for some other ornamental use or if you're growing them for timber. So other traits will depend on, on your end use and, and what you actually purchase. But first I want to debunk two myths. One of them is that local seed is always the best adapted to the site. And this is not true. Sometimes small, fragmented, or inbred populations will produce bad seed. And this is especially true for annual plants. Um, but to a lesser degree with wind-pollinated conifers. Our conifers, our spruces, our pines, because they're, because they're wind-pollinated, pollen can travel great distances. So you might have a tree out in the middle of a field that looks isolated, but in reality, pollen can travel hundreds of miles on the wind, and you can collect seed from it, and the seed is very likely to be viable. But for something like goldenrod, and that's the picture I have up here, goldenrod is one of those annual plants where the seed grows better if the neighboring plants have different genetics. So you can have crummy goldenrod um, seed if you collect it from a bad small stand of it because it's insect pollinated. So pollen doesn't quite travel the distances from like that a wind pollinated one would travel. So in some cases, the best seed resides elsewhere and we need to have an open mind. But this is, um, this is not necessarily a bad thing. There are benefits to seed transfer that I think need to be acknowledged. We very often talk about the detriments, but some of the benefits are that when it's done properly, seed transfer can diversify a population and introduce novel genes for the benefit of the next generation. This is especially relevant now with climate change in our future. Um, this is the heart of assisted migration efforts. It's, you know, should we be moving seed from points south in order to plant forests that are going to be better adapted in the future. In addition, um, I mean, and also seed transfer is a very a method that tree improvement programs use. We scour the landscape in search of good material, and sometimes the best tree might be a couple hundred miles away. We plant them into orchards, we test them, and, and that's really the way tree improvement operates to get the types of gains that we post. This map here, ignore the colors for a minute, but each of those little black, look like dots here, are little trees. Each of those trees represents a single tree from which we collected seed for our program. And we planted them at the stars. Each of the stars represents an orchard. And so you can see we've got a pretty good swath of Minnesota represented. This is our, just our jack pine population. I do want to mention international seed movement because this is, I'm going to focus on Minnesota and the lake states, but um, I want to talk about international seed movement because, as you know, you can set point to many examples where successes are spectacular. It can really work. Um, Eucalyptus grandis is grown at a five to eight year rotation in Africa, and that's to a telephone pole size. And so that's not a small feat. That's a spectacular success. Um, but and in the lake states, more locally, we've got hybrid larch. It's another exotic. It can produce, um, at year 20, more craft yields than a 50-year-old stand of jack pine. 
So it can work, and it, it can work here in Minnesota, but we can also get great failures. And I think really when it comes to setting policy and making, making a policy that works for everybody, we have to acknowledge that failures can also occur. In particular, kind of the poster child for me is Scotts pine in the U.S. Um, most Scots pine that was planted in the U.S. was planted from just the wrong seed sources. And it's generally a very stunted, poor, pathetic-looking tree compared to the, to the way it grows in Europe. And we have a stand here at the Forestry Center from Latvia that looks spectacular. But I think it's important to recognize, too, that for international seed movement, it's not taken lightly. Seed sources are carefully selected and tested before they're deployed commercially. And this is, a, you know, the case of eucalyptus grandis. While it works really well, there are some clones that don't work. And so you have to find that exact genotype that's going to grow in the climate that you're in. So the second myth is that trees that survive will, will ultimately adapt to the new environment. They'll be just fine. And it's important to acknowledge that tree, the tree might survive but it may never thrive. It might, but it might not as well. Um, and I use the word adapt in its sense that adapt really means that the offspring may be better than the parents, but the parent tree, the one you stuck in the ground, has to just survive. It's, all it can do is adjust its form. Adaptation occurs when its offspring, when it reproduces, and its offspring will get some of the environmental cues of the location that they were born in. Ontogeny, though, may also assist. And what this means is that there are some traits that are expressed as a juvenile state, but those traits are different as the tree gets bigger. And you end up with this bottleneck. If you can get them past the seedling stage, sometimes they will survive. Um, but traits in the, so an example of a trait that changes is white spruce seedlings. The seedlings will break bud really early when they're small. But if you track that tree into adulthood, by the time it's an adult, its bud break time will be a lot later. So there's some traits that are expressed differently from their young, from the time they're young to the time they're old. But we have the seedling bottleneck. Most mortality occurs among seedlings. And those that can make it and maybe do get established may be at a competitive disadvantage in the forest that they're sitting in. So we talk about seed source control, we have to talk about climatic gradients in Minnesota, where they are quite pronounced. I put up this plant hardiness zone map. This is used mostly by the horticulture industry. And it defines transfer risk for cultivars or perennials that you stick in the ground and have to endure the winter. And you know, hydrangeas and plants like that is commonly used. It's relative, it's also relevant or forestry, because it, what it acknowledges is that cold hardiness is, is, is very restrictive. And I know you can't read this well, but this is based on average annual minimum temperatures. So it's really cold. It, it's those cold temperatures, the coldest temperatures that you get. And in Minnesota, you've got this one real cold area here and um, really four other zones down there. In addition, this is a slightly different metric. This is um, the normal mean annual temperature for Minnesota. So this is max and mins from the day. And there's still a very large gradient, actually a bigger gradient when you think of it like that. Um, and Minnesota, being a continental climate, is home to a steep gradient as you travel from north to south. But in addition, it's important to acknowledge that temperature gradients are also confounded with day length. So sometimes if you have a mismatch, in a seed source, you can't tell if it's because of temperature or if it's because it's in a different photo period, a different day length, and it's responding to different environmental cues. In addition, Minnesota is home to a steep precipitation gradient. I'll show you a map in a minute that shows sort of Minnesota relative to North America in ecological terms. This is more important, I think, for interspecific transfers, so when you're considering what species to plant. There are some species that are common in the eastern forests, like red spruce, American beech, hemlock, that don't grow out here because we're too dry. So this precipitation gradient um, is important in terms, of eco in terms of ecology, but I think in terms of seed sources, like what jack pine seed source, it's not quite as important as temperature. Okay, I'm going to talk about seed zones now. Seed zones are delineated boundaries, so we delineate these boundaries ourselves. And these boundaries are used to determine the distance which 
seed can be safely moved without dire consequences for growth or survival. And I stuck up here seed zones used by the Minnesota DNR nursery program. What I'm going to do is use this as a baseline for discussion. I'm going to apply some of the research and apply it to this model and see if this, if this is still a relevant example. But first, for contrast, I want to show you a couple of other ones, some local examples. So we'll start with Ontario. Um, this is an older map. These seed zones have been tweaked and widened in recent years. But you can see the number of colors and numbers on there. There are quite a few seed zones in Ontario. And I know this got on onerous for them to manage. This is a seed map for Iowa. Now, this Iowa map is not to scale with, with Ontario. Iowa is not <laughs> that large. Um, their seed zones run separate north to south. And I know they're talking to one of their plant folks. They sort of wish they had a line there. Because so theirs acknowledge that there are steep temperature gradients, but they don't acknowledge the precipitation gradients. And again, for the trees, it might not be a big deal, but for the annual plants, it may be. And for the benefit of those in the U.S. Forest Service who are watching, these are the seed zones used by Region 9, which is the northeast, the eastern region of the Forest Service. And you'll see that here in Minnesota, they've got two regions defined, which is, I don't know how they do draw that barrier down the middle, and they show three for Wisconsin. So they're pretty conservative. They're not, they're not out of line with what the DNR is using. Okay. Now I want to pick these apart and say, how are seed zones determined? And seed zones are constructed historically based primarily on climatic variables. And that includes temperature and precipitation, also altitude, and, and perhaps on, based on soil types. Seed zones have been around for a long time. I have a nursery book that dates back to the 1920s and 30s, and they talk about seed zones. So been, there's been some acknowledgment of seed zones. But in more recent years, in the last 20, 30 years, we've gotten really heavy into ecological work and defining regions ecologically. And there hasn't been a lot of merging of the ecology, the ecology work with the old seed zone work. There's a lot of overlap, but there haven't been great efforts to really merge those those two. So I think that ecological regions may be valuable in assisting us in tweaking our seed zones to make them more useful. So to just sort of bring in the ecology groupings, this is a north map of North America that shows you can see Minnesota here in our three-way junction. And I'm going to zone zoom in on this quick. But this signature that goes all the way up here is visible from space. So we are right on the edge of the prairie. And it's a pretty important uh, distinction for us. Zooming in, these are the ecological provinces. This is like the biggest uh, grouping that they have. We have our Laurentian mixed forests up here. We have the, the broadleaf forest here. And then we have the prairie here. And then the tall grass um, aspen up there. Here, this map shows on the right, show, it actually acknowledges that there are, you know, the state boundaries are indeed political, that these ecological uh, zones do run across state lines. And this is the tension zone that's separates Wisconsin to its three seed zones. And again, you can see our forest up here and the prairie that runs down there. And those are fairly broad but can be narrowed. Here's one example. Yeah, they, the, the ecological seed zones get big to small. And you can pick any size that you want, uh, depending on what you're using them for. This one is the floristic regions of the fire-dependent woodland system. These are interesting to me because these run basically east. They run diagonally across the state. They don't, they're not just straight north to south, and they're not just straight east to west. So this map I'm going to return to in a minute when we're talking about jack pine. So back to the DNR seed zones. The question is, is, are these seed zones too large? Are they too small? Or are they just right? And the reason I'm even talking about this is um, I'll get to my bullet two, my bullet three. The new legislation in fiscal year 12 precludes the sale of trees from the Minnesota DNR state nursery program to private landowners. These zones are fairly small. They're conservative. They're very safe if you can use them great. But it's difficult for private nurseries to maintain these because you would be, you're being asked to maintain if you're selling, if you're selling 
across the state, you're being asked to maintain different seed sources of white spruce, multiple seed sources of jack pine and black spruce. And in the private nursery sector, where people aren't buying tens of thousands of trees, that's very difficult to maintain in your nursery program. So I felt that a review of these seed zones is necessary so that private landowners and the private nurseries that serve them can benefit by a standard that is acceptable and defendable um, for all, for the benefit of the nurse of the um, forest land that is on private property. Okay, so what I want to do is use this as a base and just examine how these work, and then we're going to look at transfer distances using some data. So the DNR seed zones are based on Rudolph 1956, and Rudolph's paper relies heavily, and Rudolph's seed zones rely heavily on temperature and precipitation gradients. I know you can't read these well. Um, so what I did is I drew one of them in. This is 3C. And so Rudolph's groupings are based on, and I'm sorry for this description below, this is right out of the text, average annual accumulation of average daily temperatures of 50 degrees, blah. Okay, here's what it means. The number, they're alphanumeric, so the number refers to the degree days. And so number one, which are these bottom seed zones here, are 11,000 plus. Two is 10,000 to 11,000, three. And so these are degree days through the growing season. The letter refers to average January temperatures. So again, that cold hardiness factor is in. So C is zero to 20 and, and so on. Um, but they're based on this alphanumeric that combine both of them together. And I can read this even worse on the screen than I could at home. And there's 4B up there. The nice thing with this is it allows you to group them based on, on the number or on the letter, depending on how you're using them. In addition, what I like about this map is it goes across the lake states. It acknowledges that these are all one, um, you can be seed zones cross state barriers. Okay. Next, I want to talk about, I'm just going to mention this, it is not that important in Minnesota, but in mountainous areas, seed zones get very complicated, and you can imagine why. If you're on the top of the mountain, the weather climate is going to be very different from what's in the valley below. So I show Washington State here, and you can see the topography below, I'll get my arrow going, you can see the topography down here, and you can see, too, how these lines kind of match it. So when you've got mountainous areas, it can be very tricky to set up seed zones, and they tend to be very, very small. But here in Minnesota, we're relatively flat. Um, there are not great, there, there's local topographical relief that you need to pay careful attention to. You don't want to plant trees in a frost pocket. But on a macro scale, there are not great uh, differences in, um, in our topography, which is good. However, even on our flatlands, not all transfers are alike, and we need to think about those kinds of transfers as we're making these types of decisions. And I'm going to return to Rudolph in a minute, but seed sources can be, can be moved greater distances with fewer consequences from east to west than from north to south. And I'm going to pop this up here, but I did a color in some of Rudolph's groupings, and you can see pretty plainly that you can move, these seed zones are very long east to west, but they're very short from north to south. And that's, and we'll explore the consequences of this on the next slide. So why is this so detrimental, this north to south movement? Why, do you, why are these seed zones so flat? Well, and the reason is something we've already talked about. The transfer is occurring across steep temperature gradients and across photoperiodic gradients. So north to south, you've got both of those that are confounded. And with photoperiod, though, it really can't be underestimated. Plants get their energy from the sun, and they are highly tuned to day length to a degree that we don't understand. And many phenological processes are tuned to day length, particularly those that happen in the fall. So fall senescence is largely controlled by day length. It's also cool temperatures, but to a larger extent, trees shut down in the fall according to day length. To a lesser degree, spring bud break is affected by day length. Spring bud break time is usually governed mostly by the accumulation of warming degree days, but it's also modified to some extent by day length. So, so photo period is really important. And the processes that, um, that relate to phenology and asynchrony are quite severe. Plants that break their buds too soon in the spring, 
can get easily frosted. Those that are not ready for our winters in the fall, they shut down too late, are also going to be in some trouble. So, but I want to look at this a little bit more closely. There are north to south transfers and south to north transfers. And I want to look at the consequences of each of these because they're important. OK. So let's say you collect cones up here in Cooch County and you plant them down in southern Minnesota. What can you expect? You're moving your seed from the north to the south. What typically happens, and this is going to be counterintuitive for some of you, but they're going to break down here in the southern climate. This seed, uh, this seed, if you move down here, is actually going to break bud earlier than the local sources. And the reason is, is that these things are genetically programmed. And this is one of those adaptations that they acquire from the site they're living in. They learn that at this site, they need maybe 500 warming degree days to break bud. The tree down here is in this warmer climate. And maybe it only needs, um, maybe it needs six or 700 degree days for it to break bud. So what happens is when you move this down here, it earns its 300 degree days in a week. It would take it a month to get that amount up here. But it earns them very, very quickly. And so it breaks bud sooner than the local sources. In addition, they have very highly conservative growth. So the tr this tree that you put down here is actually going to shut down earlier than the local sources. So what you've done is you've shifted the entire growing season earlier. And that can work, but there also can be negative consequences to it. OK, how about south to north transfers? So you take your seed, you collect it from down here, and you're going to plant it up here maybe in, in southern Cooch County. What are the consequences? I'm going to leave my arrow on. What happens is, when you move them from south to north, the bud break actually occurs later than the local sources. Again, it's the same concept. This tree, it takes it about a month maybe, or it takes it a lot longer to earn those degree days up here. And so it will break its bud later than local sources. It takes more time for it to accumulate degree days in this cooler climate. Um, now, these bullets should probably be switched. The consequence, or maybe the, the, the problem that it may have also, is that it might grow too long into the fall. It might extend its growing season in the fall. As a consequence of that, the growth tends to meet or exceed local sources. So transfers from south to north in terms of growth that you can expect are better than transfers from north to south. So when you're talking about, I mean, this is just north to south, how do we estimate the actual seed transfer distances? I mean, when have we moved them too far? This is difficult to do, but we have a lot of provenance trials. And I'll show you what those are trials that are planted at multiple locations that can provide us with baseline data to govern these distances. These trials are also being used to assist us in understanding the impact of climate change on forest trees and our local tree species. OK, so I'm going to show you the mechanics of a provenance trial. This is from a paper written by Bill Parker and his graduate students. Bill is at Lakehead University in Thunder Bay, which is here or so. And what they've done here, actually, I'll keep my arrow on. The, I know it's hard to read this, but each of these green dots represents a collection. So somebody went to a stand here in Alaska, and they collected a bunch of seed from a bunch of trees. And they kept it separate from another collection made here and here and all across the geographic range. And those seeds were collected, and they were brought to a grower, grown together. And I think they were, may have been done in Rhinelander. And then they were planted at all the different star locations. And in a great trial, when everything works beautifully and everything germinates, you've got every seed source represented at every location. So every star has a copy of trees from every location across the geographic range. So this is a classic sort of common garden test. And we're lucky, you can see here, we have for black spruce, we have one here at Rosemount, south of the Twin Cities. We've got one in Grand Rapids as well. And these are in place for black spruce, white spruce, jack pine, red pine, white pine, balsam fir. Uh, there are a lot of different trees. There was a big push to do these in the 1960s with the Forest Service. So using some of the data that has been published, and I didn't reanalyze this. I've measured some of these myself, and I have new data. But using the data that was published, 
uh, I'm going to give you some seed transfer distances for three species, red pine, jack pine, and white spruce. I'm going to start with red pine. Now, red pine is one of our bookends. Red pine has the lowest amount of genetic variation. That means from tree to tree to tree to tree, if you kind of skip across the range, there are not the geographic range, that is from Minnesota to Maine, there are not huge differences in, in the genetic variation. They're very similar. All the trees are very, very similar genetics. So this is a bookend. Because of that, you can move red pine further than you can move other species. So in these common garden trials, and the picture you're seeing is at the Cloquet Forestry Center. It's a range-wide test. This is reported by Wright et al. in 1972. What they found was at all the locations at the common garden, they found that seed sources that had the slowest growth originated from New Brunswick, Manitoba, and western Ontario. The far eastern and far western edges of the range did the worst in red pine. Seed sources with the fastest growth generally originated in lower Michigan, incidentally kind of right smack in the middle of the geographic range. So, but this paper by Nelson and Moan in 1987 looked more closely at the productivity in northern Minnesota field tests. And I'll show you those results. And what they found is the two best sources for growing in northern Minnesota was, came from northern Wisconsin. You had 19% more cords of wood, and they said, so this is volume. Uh, than, per acre than the test average. And north central Minnesota, where you had 27% more cords per acre. The LP of Michigan also did well. Their concern with this test is that they did see there was some sign of local sources in northeast Minnesota that were actually lower than the average. So here's the case where the local sources were not your best bet. So let's go back again using the DNR as a basis for this. Red pine occurs mostly in these areas. There's some in southern Minnesota as well. Um, I would recommend, though, based on this, combining seed from this zone, the north central zone, and this one, the central zone, to reforest. In addition, I would avoid collections from the northeast. These seed collected in this blue area should not be planted in the blue area. If you're going to plant trees in the northeast instead, I would recommend using seed from more southern parts of the range. So seed from the northeast should probably be shipped to Ontario but not used locally in that area. All right, that's red pine. Next, I'm going to look at jack pine. Jack pine is our other bookend. Um, jack pine has a tremendous amount of genetic variation. There is huge variation from one stand to the next, from one population to the next. So that was red pine. We'll contrast it here with jack pine. There are range-wide provenance tests in jack pine. I will get back to what this silly diagram means in a minute. Um, some results, though. One of the more pronounced results is that gall rust incidence was closely linked with tree volume. And for those of you who don't know what gall rust is, it is a fungal disease. We call it just gall rust. Um, it makes, I have a picture of it in a minute. But sources from northern Minnesota, and again, I'll show you where these, I believe these boundaries are, had the slowest growth and the highest gall incidence when they were planted in common gardens. And they also found that local sources within 100 miles of the planting site, within 100 miles south of the planting site yielded the highest volume. So this here, this legend here shows the 100 mile line. And what I did was I copied it and I pasted it and popped it here in the middle of the state and drew, um, drew the circle. But actually, this isn't drawn right because it should be 100 miles. If the arrow is my planting site, it should be 100 miles south. It's really where you should be getting seed from for jack pine. So another, another analysis, another paper I read deals with tree ring width. So they didn't just measure heights and diameters like we typically do, but they actually took increment cores and measured the tree ring widths in a common garden. And they also found kind of a similar result. The provenance is originating from warmer, drier climates, had higher radial grades, so more growth than those from the cooler northern climate. So pretty much echoing, and this is Sava et al.'s paper from 2007, kind of similar to Jefferson Jensen's paper from 1980. 
And so we've got two papers here that both basically state the same thing. And there's been more evidence that suggests that jack pine requires the most stringent seed zones of any conifer in the state. And I deliberately chose these two pictures. Here we've got the open cones that are typical of the, kind of the southern edge of jack pine's range along the prairie border. Here are the closed cones that are more typical of northeast, like the arrowhead of Minnesota. These formed distinct populations. And I'll show you the work that reported this. This is from 1976 paper, Roland Schenke, to the geographic variation in jack pine. What he did, he went to all these different locations. He went there, 78, he numbered them. And it all across the geographic range. He must have had a great travel budget. He collected cones, he collected bark, he collected needles, and about 35 different traits. And he measured from all these trees across this range. And then he used the cluster analysis, this multivariate statistical tool, to group them by phenotype. Phenotype, not genotype. He wasn't collecting DNA. Based on the phenotype, he developed these groupings here. And what's interesting about Minnesota, so we're down here on the edge of the range. This is showing kind of the natural range of jack pine. We have the south central population. We have this middle central population and this north central population. And incidentally, the north central population was associated with those open cones. The middle central was associated, I'm sorry, with the closed cones. The middle central here is associated with those open cones, and the south central also had open cones. But there's distinct differences in cone serotony. And that cone serotony is sort of part of a bigger story about the paleo history of jack pine. And that's a longer story, and John Almendinger with the Minnesota DNR does a wonderful talk on that. So these floristic regions were created using Schenick, some of Schenicke's work and some of John, John Almendinger's work. And so they developed these floristic regions based on the climate, but also of the paleo history of jack pine and the plants and cohorts that are associated with it. So you have the central zone here, again, that was associated with those open cones. And you have this northern region here that is associated with the closed cones. And the southern population down here, which is very edgy along that follows the edge of the prairie. So, Let's see, OK. Um, with jack pine, though, and I'm going to get back to this gall rust, and I'm going to show you that map one more time. Gall rust is a major impediment to growth and survival. We found this more recently in data sets. So for those of you who don't know what it looks like, this is it, it makes these, these orange like softballs or baseballs on the stems themselves. They can occur across the crown. They're kind of ugly. But worstly, uh, they can be damaging because they sometimes occur on the main stem, and it's a weak point where the trees easily snap and cause mortality. Now, I apologize for the quality of this. I scanned this out of a paper from 1985 by Dietrich and Al, and actually one of the co-authors is Bob Lanchette, who's a pathologist here at the University of Minnesota. And this was, this was published in the Canadian Journal Forest Research. What this shows is the distribution of the two jack pine gall rust species that occur in the state. One of them is Endocrinarchium harknessii, and that is the pine pine rust. So gall rust, like all these pesky little rusts, have these alternate hosts. Up here in northern Minnesota, there aren't any oaks around. And in this case, the pine pine, it, the whole life cycle happens on pine. Down here in central Minnesota, we have the pine oak rust. I'll move my arrow there. Those are the open circles. So what they did for this study is they traveled across the state, and they went to individual trees and collected those galls, and then they keyed them out taxonomically to figure out what they are. And they ended up with these distinct populations, these lines, that overlap rather interestingly with this work from the DNR from the floristic regions. And it's very interesting because these regions these papers were not, didn't, weren't used. They didn't use one paper to write the other. This is a completely separate data set. And it works pretty well. The only difference is here, quite blatantly where I am, here in Carlton County, they show this as being the, the pine oak gall. And down here, it doesn't quite overlap with the northern zone. But those, those two lines, this, this green zone and these clear holes, are very interesting. And part of one of the reasons that seed source control in jack pine is so important is that this hypothesis, and this hasn't been well tested, is that these trees here 
the tree that live in this green area actually have some local resistance to this pine oak gall rust. And the pine pine rust isn't nearly as severe, although maybe some foresters can take me to stands that are bad. But typically here, there's, there's some local resistance. Up here, there is no local resistance. So seed transfer becomes kind of interesting. What we found, well, so we're suggesting that maybe these floristic regions could inform seed zones, especially for planting jack pine in Minnesota. And what we observed in the Tree Improvement Cooperative, we have a second generation population and one is located at the, at the yellow star here, one is located at the orange star. And what we found, so we know the location, we know the parents, we know where they came from originally, we know, who, we know both parents, because these are full sieve trials. What we found is that here in central Minnesota, the seed sources that came from up here, northern Minnesota, were much, much more susceptible to the gall rust than the sources that originated locally. And this is important because when you have a lot of gall rust, you have a lot of mortality and a lot of death. So this is sort of critical to, this becomes critical with jack pine. So I would suggest with jack pine that we need a minimum of two seed zones, possibly three. I don't know if we need one down here in southern Minnesota. I don't know if we need to further subdivide this northeast region and not use the seed. It's not well known at this point. Um, but it seems to me that the seed zones that follow the floristic regions are ideal because it allows us to capture these differences in these gall rust populations. However, we need to be very, very careful. Transfer from, south, from the northeast to the southwest is highly undesirable, again, because of gall rust, but also differences in growth. Okay, I'm going to switch gears to white spruce, Tysia glauca. And white spruce is kind of in the middle with respect to red pine and jack pine. Oops, I'll take this off. Um, with white spruce, the, the Provenance trials found clear negative correlations between height and latitude. They found that, in general, sources north of 50 degrees latitude grew slowly, especially in Minnesota. And north of 50 degrees latitude puts you in Manitoba, Alaska, Saskatchewan, BC, Ontario, and Labrador. They also found above average growth from sources along the southern edge of the range. And some of you may recall we have some sources from Ottawa Valley, and that very much qualifies into being along the southern edge of the range. Now, they've done some more work in Ontario recently. They've reestablished some common garden trials, and they developed transfer distances in Ontario that are fairly broad, much broader than that seed zone map that I showed you. And so they're looking at this as well. And one thing they found are set safe transfer distance of 3 degrees latitude and 10 to 12 degrees longitude. And again, this is in Ontario. And this was uh, Ashley Thompson and others in 2010 in the Canadian Journal Forest Research. So what does that look like in our landscape? We would take the Ontario recommendations and move them south. What does it look like? This is 3 degrees latitude. So pretty much you can move, if you follow their recommendations, you can move white spruce pretty liberally around the northern part of the state. And what is 10 degrees longitude? Well, that takes you clear across Wisconsin and into portions of the UP. So these are very large transfer distances. Um, but I do have a concern of co negative correlations between latitude and height might become restrictive. So again, looking at the DNR seed zone, and I'm going to go, I haven't talked much about the tree improvement program, but we do have improved sources of white spruce that are available. We've got more white spruce than we have other species of improved material. And through genetic testing, we've learned that these improved sources can be planted statewide. We have progeny tests all over the place. Good material that grow, good material at one site is good at all of them. Wild oak sources, though, don't seem to have that same transfer distance. I have unpublished data, and I'm going to publish it at some point. It'll be part of my dissertation, that seed from the northeast seed zone might require its own separate seed zone, and maybe we don't want to collect from there. Um, in addition, it's beneficial to favor southern or improved sources, but you don't want to move them from north to south. Okay. Now, I'm going to deviate a little bit. I want to mention a little bit about climate change, uh, although this isn't the crux of this talk. So what seed sources should we be planting? Well, certainly not that. Um, but the answer is that we really don't know yet in Minnesota. We haven't completed the research. 
It'll depend on the extent and severity of climate change. But luckily, we look to our neighbors to the north for examples of how they can do, of how they're doing it, and what, and what you know, what are the possibilities for us? And what they found at Lakehead University, they made calculations for northwestern Ontario for jack pine, white, and black spruce based on different climate change scenarios. This is a very multivariate statistical analysis, very interesting, very robust, very land-based as well. Uh, and they have a number, they've had a number of findings. One of them is that, and, and their findings relate also to Europe and Scots pine. One common finding is that climate change is expected to reduce growth in the southern and central parts of the range, but it's expected to improve growth in the far north. Sorry, my bullets are out of order. So the far northern sources are going to start growing faster than we expect. Central and southern sources are going to grow a little bit slower than we expect them. And this is important for us in considering seed sources because another paper, and this is Davis and Shaw in 2001, which is very, very highly cited, is that they find, and this is a quote from their article in Science, is that we find that adaptation may be most restricted at the trailing edge where populations are, pre -de are deprived of gene flow from pre-adapted populations. So southern populations are at risk. Further, we have these southern populations in the lake states, very much so. These are the, the location of the southern genotypes that are most adapted to the warmest conditions currently. And so we have a responsibility, probably, at least the Canadians may think this, to conserve these genotypes for the future. And populations along these range edges are prime candidates for conservation. They are the most at risk, as Davis and Shaw revealed. These, though, are the sources, these southern edge sources, of, as I've noted in other species, are the ones that we need to move north to improve our own reforestation efforts. And so we really need to be thinking about she transfer from south to north, both to conserve them, but also to maintain the grow expectations of growth. This picture I'm showing you here is actually what that provenance trial that I showed you in Rosemount, south of the Twin Cities. This is black spruce, and it does grow down here. It's very limmy, though. I don't know if you can see all the little. We, I had somebody clean this up for us. Very, very limmy. It can grow. And this is providing some of the data that we need to determine seed sources to use in the future. So in summary, how do we establish sufficient seed zones for Minnesota in a current and future climate? I think we need to rely on a combination of data both from ecological classification and the old seed zones and the climate variables. Both will help us make good decisions. But I don't think a one-size-fits-all approach is necessary or practical. Um, we can use different seed zone models for different species. We can use a fairly broad one for red pine. You could probably use one for Minnesota. Again, I wouldn't use collections from the Northeast. Intermediate for white spruce, I think we can merge the two seed zones. We can use most of the arrowhead in one. Again, we might need to consider that northern source as being separate. And for jack pine, it's got to be narrow, probably two, possibly three seed zones um, to cover the state. But if you're in a position where you don't have it from your local seed zone, select a seed source from points south. Southern sources do tend to grow faster than northern sources. They'll have more conservative spring phenology. They won't break bud earlier. If anything, they'll break later, and they will grow longer into the fall. Um, we can also look to Wisconsin for some species, especially if you're following the ecological zones for jack pine. There may be sources in Wisconsin that are suitable. And in some cases, going out to the UP isn't necessarily bad either. I would also recommend using improved seed when it's available. This is me at one of our orchards. Orchard seed is tested. It's tested to be adapted. We measure and address genotype by environment interactions. Poor performing genotypes are removed from the orchards, and it outgrows local sources by a large margin. Interestingly, too, tree improvement has a lot of mechanisms in place to actually conserve genotypes. We collect them, we put them in orchards, we graft them. A lot of seed conservation work happens naturally in tree improvement programs. And we want to plan for a warmer future now. You want to favor southern genotypes, actively conserve them. Gene conservation will really help us build a bridge to the forests of the future. This is Cartwright Road to this day is still washed out. But we need more research to identify the best seed sources for the future. This is not a done deal. We don't have the data or the analysis yet in Minnesota to guide these transfer decisions. So 
for those of you who are able to, I encourage you to plan to attend our workshop on October 25th at the Cloquet Forestry Center. This is the title, Tree, Sealed, Tim Tree Seed Timber Yields and Transfer Guidelines, 30 Years of Progress by the Minnesota Tree Improvement Cooperative. Uh, we will have at that meeting as well, uh, Bill Parker is going to be speaking, Howard Hoganson, Andy Davis from the University of Minnesota, Paul Charette, who runs the Tree Improvement Program up there, Rick Claiborne, and myself. And I want to thank all of our MTIC members, past and present, for their over 30 years of support. And thank you for listening. And I am, that concludes this.